Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And today, Tracy, I'm kind of excited because I've had this story on my list for a while. <laughs> Uh, We are going to talk about a man who was born into slavery, which sounds not so levity-enhanced as my giggles might suggest, but he escaped in a really astonishing way. And his story of how he gained his freedom was so sensational that he basically spent the rest of his life making a living talking about it in one form or another. So today we are talking about Henry Box Brown, and we're just going to jump right into his story. Yes, so he was born in 1815 or 1816. There's no known record of his exact birthday, but he was born in Louisa County, Virginia, which is about 45 miles from Richmond. This was on a plantation called the Hermitage, and he was enslaved from birth. And in his account of his life, Henry talked about uh, an incident where he would carry grain 20 miles to a mill several times a year as a boy. And those trips, which he took with his brother, were also fact-finding missions where the two boys would get information about the other enslaved people that lived nearby and any other news going on in Virginia. And on one such trip, the boys met a large group of enslaved men, and they spoke with them, and they started to realize that the two of them were in a unique situation. The boys had clothes, and they had shoes, and the other enslaved men remarked upon them uh, as something that they did not have. And the boys also heard enslaved men being beaten. They were also asked by a white man whether they had ever been whipped, and they replied that they hadn't. And that caused this white man to reply that they would never amount to anything. So through all of these interactions, the boys became really aware that they had a kind of precarious place in the world. They, I I mean, it's, they were still enslaved, but were in a position that was a little better uh, in some ways. And they realized they could easily end up in a similar situation to these people they had spoken with who didn't have clothes and shoes, and and were routinely beaten. Yeah, they kind of appreciated the fact that they did get clothes, they did get shoes, they were not beaten as a matter of course. And they understood very quickly that uh, people who were enslaved had no control over their life's course, and they could easily end up just wherever they might land based on the whim of someone else. When Henry was about 15, he and his mother were called to the deathbed of their owner, John Barrett. And things on Barrett's plantation had gotten a little bit rougher uh, because Barrett had hired an overseer to manage things when he could not really keep up with running everything himself. And so they had had a taste of that more difficult situation. And Henry and his mother believed that their summons to Barrett's bedside was in fact so that they could tell them that they were going to be freed upon his death. They literally believed this when they walked into that room. But instead, they got the news that John Barrett was giving Henry to his son, William. And with Barrett's death, his estate was divided four ways among his sons, and Henry's family was torn apart in the process. He later wrote of this time, quote, this kind of torture is a thousandfold more cruel and barbarous than the use of the lash which lacerates the back. The lashes which the whip or the cowskin makes may heal, and the place which was marked in a little while may cease to exhibit the signs of what it had endured. But the pangs which lacerate the soul in consequence of the forcible disruption of parent and the dearest family ties only grow deeper and more piercing as memory fetches from a greater distance the horrid acts by which they have been produced. Henry was moved to Richmond to work in a tobacco factory that William Barrett owned. William assured Henry that if he worked hard and he behaved, that he would be taken care of and he would also be paid a small bit of money. William was overheard at one point by Henry telling the overseer at the factory that Henry should never be whipped, that he had been raised by William's father, and that he was a very smart boy. In 1831, Henry witnessed the aftermath of Nat Turner's rebellion, in which more than 60 Black men, some enslaved and some free, had killed more than 50 people. After the rebellion, there was a lot of retaliatory violence against enslaved people, 
Henry later wrote about witnessing many people, quote, whipped, hung, and cut down with swords in the streets and worse. He asked William Barrett what was happening and was told only that some enslaved men, quote, had plotted to kill their owners. Henry only figured out long after the fact that he had seen this famous rebellion. In 1836, Henry wanted to marry a woman that he had met named Nancy. Nancy was also enslaved, but she was owned by a man named Mr. Lee, who was a banker, and not William Barrett, who owned Henry. So Henry spoke with Mr. Lee, who said that he had no intention of selling Nancy, and that if William Barrett could say the same of Henry, that he would approve the marriage. So Nancy and Henry were married, but just a year later, Mr. Lee reneged on his promise. He sold Nancy to a saddler named Joseph A. Colquitt. And Colquitt and his wife treated Nancy far worse than her previous owner had, and after a great deal of animosity, particularly on the part of Mrs. Colquitt, Nancy was sold once again. But the Colquitts soon bought her back when they realized just how much she had been doing for them. Eventually, she was sold once again, but this time the man who purchased her, Samuel Cottrell, cut Henry a deal that if Henry regularly paid him $50, he would let the couple and their children live together. Henry, of course, had to arrange and pay for a home, in addition to the regular annual payments that he had to make. Yeah, this is like one of those situations where, in effect, Cottrell couldn't make the initial payment to purchase Nancy outright. He was short, and that $50 made up the gap. But then he also charged Henry another $50 annually, and Henry had to pay for all of Nancy's life necessities, room board, et cetera. So Cottrell was basically getting paid to keep this woman enslaved by her husband um, because it was the only way that Nancy and Henry could be together. And it was during this time that Henry met James Caesar Anthony Smith, a free Black man that he knew from church. And James helped Henry find a home where he and Nancy and the children could live because at this point they had several. Uh, James C.A. Smith arranged for the rental of a home in his own name at $71 per year for the Browns. And for a while, though Henry was basically being extorted by Cottrell to not sell Nancy, they were living happily as a family. In 1848, the Browns had been married for 12 years. They had three children and a fourth on the way. And then Cottrell abruptly sold Nancy and the children who were all immediately removed from their home and taken to a prison for holding until the next day, at which point they would begin a journey to North Carolina. In addition, he had all the Brown family's possessions seized for auction. Henry begged his owner to buy his family, but he got nowhere pursuing that line of thinking. He managed to buy back some of their things with the small amount of money he had, but he could only watch as his family along with several hundred other people, were marched down the street to begin this journey to North Carolina. And as his wife approached, Henry took her hand and he held it as he walked for approximately four miles with the group before they were parted for good. One of the themes of Henry's account of his life is the discussion of the hypocrisy of the white men who would call themselves Christian and still engage in slavery. I feel like this is made several appearances on the podcast, including in our recent episode on Phyllis Wheatley. After his loss of Nancy and the children, his own faith was not shaken, but he believed that slave owners could not truly be men of God. That forced separation after such a constant state of shifting assurances from owners catalyzed a fervent desire for freedom in Henry. He had been lied to and toyed with and finally had what was most important to him taken away, and he was intent on ending his own enslavement. We'll talk about Henry's bolt of inspiration for his escape plan after we pause for a quick sponsor break. Henry describes precisely the moment where he had his idea for escape in his writing. Quote, one day while I was at work and my thoughts were eagerly feasting upon the idea of freedom, I felt my soul called out to heaven to breathe a prayer to Almighty God. 
I prayed fervently that he who seeth in secret and knew the inmost desires of my heart would lend me his aid in bursting my fetters asunder and in restoring me to the possession of those rights of which men had robbed me. When the idea suddenly flashed across my mind of shutting myself up in a box and getting myself conveyed as dry goods to a free state. The idea of sealing himself in a box to be shipped to freedom was obviously not without danger. There was a very real risk that he could die in the process, but Henry Brown was willing to take that risk rather than remain enslaved. To make his escape, Henry was going to need some help, and so he turned once again to James Caesar Anthony Smith, and he also had assistance from a white man that James introduced him to named Samuel Smith, who was no relation to James. Henry knew he would have to get a few days of leave from work to give himself a good chance where nobody would be alarmed that he was absent. He had a finger that was infected, and he thought he might use that as an excuse. But his overseer didn't think this injury was bad enough for him him to need to miss work. So Henry poured what was called oil of vitriol on it. This was really sulfuric acid. He wound up causing a lot more damage than he intended to, but it worked. He got permission to miss work and treat the wound, and his friends managed to make contact with people in Philadelphia who would be willing to receive this box. Brown's box was lined with fabric, very similar to what you might find on a pool table, and Henry had cut three holes in the box for air, and he took a gimlet, which is kind of like an awl, uh, with him into the box in case he needed to cut more during the journey. He also took a bladder of water, both so that he could hydrate himself in small amounts and also so he could potentially put it on his face uh, if he needed to. And this box was, according to Henry's account, three feet, one inch wide, two feet, six inches high, and two feet wide. Henry had hired a carpenter to specially make it for him with the small amount of money that he had saved up, and it was marked as dry goods. Henry folded himself into this box, and then his friends nailed it shut. He was taken a mile to the shipping station. He sh- Samuel shipped the box on March 23rd, 1849, by the Adams Express Company. And the box then made its journey over the course of 27 hours. Almost immediately, it was flipped on its end, so Henry's head was down. And then when he was moved from a wagon to a baggage car, it landed on its side, which was a little more comfortable. But when he was placed onto a steamer at Potomac Creek, he once again was stood on end with his head down. He thought he might die because the pressure around his face was so much that he focused on the idea of freedom and resolved to just get through the discomfort. As he was becoming convinced that his life really was in danger, two men on the steamer shifted the crate to its side to use it as a seat. After some additional jostling and being tossed around and put into a position that was bottom end up again, he finally came to rest in luggage storage at the train depot until a gentleman came to ask about the box and collect it. To me, it sounds so terrifying, one, to be shut up in a box, but two, the idea of being stood head down for hours on end like that is so scary. Uh, And from there, after the man collected the box, it was taken to the Philadelphia Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, They had a headquarters there. And Underground Railroad conductor William Still, who was part of this group that had assembled to receive the box, wrote of the moment that the box was open. All was quiet. The door had been safely locked. The proceedings commenced. Mr. J.M. McKinn rapped quietly on the lid of the box and called out, All right? Instantly came the answer from within. All right, sir. The witnesses will never forget that moment. Saw and Hatchet quickly had the five hickory hoops cut and the lid off, and the marvelous resurrection of Brown ensued. Rising up in the box, he reached out his hand, saying, How do you do, gentlemen? The little assemblage hardly knew what to think or do at the moment. He was about as wet as if he had come up out of the Delaware. Very soon, he remarked that before leaving Richmond, he had selected for his arrival hymn, if he lived, the psalm beginning with these words. I awaited patiently for the Lord, and he heard my prayer. And most touchingly did he sing the psalm, much to his own relief, as well as to the delight of his small audience. So Henry Brown was free. The success of Brown's escape 
also really caused a rift among abolitionists. There were people who wanted to publicize it as a victory for the anti-slavery cause, and these folks thought that it might inspire similarly creative ideas among enslaved people and their sympathizers. But other people, including Frederick Douglass, thought that it should be kept a secret. If you've heard our episode on Frederick Douglass, he didn't want to publicize his own way of escape uh, because of the risk. Um, The logic was that if they didn't let word get out that Henry had escaped slavery in this manner, that other people could potentially be freed the same way. And Samuel Smith, who was the white man who had assisted Brown in Virginia, came to the decision as well that this shipping method should be used to free other enslaved people. So Smith, once again with the help of James Caesar Anthony Smith, made another attempt on May 8th of 1849. But unfortunately, their efforts were discovered. Both men were arrested, although James Smith did not face any jail time for his involvement. He was kind of written off because, as a Black man, they believed that he had not been smart enough to really be uh, a mastermind in this whole plan. But in November of that year, Samuel Smith was sentenced to six and a half years in prison. Ultimately, Henry, who was now nicknamed Henry Box Brown, became a public story. It was really not possible to keep the secret of such an amazing escape secret. Within a matter of weeks, he was well-known within the abolitionist movement. Brown began touring, telling the tale of his 27 hours in the box to find his way to freedom. He first told the story at the New England Anti-Slavery Convention in Boston at the end of May 1849, so just two months after he began. He also wrote his life story, including his daring trip to freedom, In actuality, this this account, which is titled Narrative of Henry Box Brown, was written largely by abolitionist Charles Stearns, who also published it. Henry Brown and Charles Stearns actually went on book tour together, and the proceeds from that book were used to fund a new lecture tour. And for his stage appearances, Henry Brown developed his act to add a panoramic painting that he had had commissioned, titled Mirror of Slavery. And this painting was spooled across the stage, almost like a slideshow, to tell the story of how people had been stolen from Africa and enslaved, and what slavery in the U.S. was truly like from the enslaved person's perspective. His friend, James Caesar Anthony Smith, who had left Richmond after his arrest and release, joined him on stage for these presentations. The two men eventually had a falling out, however, and we'll talk about that towards the end of the episode. Next up, we're going to talk about how the Compromise of 1850 once again changed Henry's life, but we're going to take another quick sponsor break before we get to that part of the story. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 shifted Henry Box Brown's life yet again. For a quick refresher, this is a very quick version. The Fugitive Slave Act was part of the Compromise of 1850. It stated that people who had escaped enslavement and were found in states where slavery was abolished would still be shipped back to their owners with the support of the federal government in their capture and return, and that fugitive enslaved people were not entitled to jury trial and they could not testify on their own behalf. In August of 1850, just before the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, Brown was in Providence, Rhode Island, when he was assaulted in the street. This convinced him that it wasn't safe to stay in the United States, so he moved to England and took his stage show with him. He continued to perform his anti-slavery act there, and he added additional dimensions to it. In 1851, Henry Box Brown also wrote a second memoir, this one titled Narrative of the Life of Henry Box Brown, written by himself. In truth, it is almost exactly the same as the first book, although it is written in less flowery prose and includes additional details. While Brown was always insistent that he had not been treated nearly as badly as a lot of other enslaved people, he wanted to add his voice to the other testimonies and narratives that would evidence just how dehumanizing and wrong the institution of slavery was. His book opens with a preface that reads, quote, so much has already been written concerning the evils of slavery and by men so much more able to portray its horrid form than I am that I might well be excused if I were to remain altogether silent on the subject. But however much has been written, however much has been said, and however much has been done, I feel impelled by the voice of my own conscience from the recent experience which I have had of the alarming extent to which the traffic in human beings carried on. 
and the cruelties, both bodily and mental, to which men in the condition of slaves are continually subjected, and also from the hardening and blasting influences which this traffic produces on the character of those who thus treat as goods and chattels the bodies and souls of their fellows. To add yet one other testimony of and protest against this foul blot of the state of morals, of religion, and of cultivation in the American Republic, for I feel convinced that enough has not been written, enough has not been said, enough has not been done, while nearly four millions of human beings possessing immortal souls are in chains, dragging out their existence in the southern states. And just uh, for the sake of transparency, it is generally believed that Henry Box Brown did not actually write all of this, even though it is listed as written by himself, that probably he verbally spoke all of this and someone took it down and probably cleaned up the grammar for him. But it is basically the same story that he was telling on stage night after night after night. So it's corroborated in his his verbal history. It's not as though someone wrote a completely different version of his life. Uh, so for the next 25 years, Henry Box Brown lived and performed in England, and he also married a second wife there named Jane, and they started a family together. And during that time in England, he continued to tell his tale of escape, but after his falling out with James Smith, his act became less about abolition and more about magic. He would perform sleight-of-hand tricks where he transformed a, a nail into an acorn, and on occasion he would stage a reenactment of his box journey on stage, which played out like a magician's escape trick, but with the added gravity of recalling his harrowing escape. In 1851, he staged a large-scale reenactment of his box escape when he had himself shipped from Bradford to Leeds in West Yorkshire. And it is actually unknown where Henry Box Brown first learned to perform magic tricks. It could well have been as far back as his childhood, uh, as something that was done among the enslaved people as entertainment. But as his act evolved, his knowledge expanded, and he started to transform himself into other stage personas. He would sometimes dress as an African chief and walk through towns that he was touring into as an advertisement for his shows, conjuring for this character version of himself a noble lineage and all of this done to entice an audience. He began to combine the worlds of magic and science as he and his act started exploring mesmerism and electrobiology. There's been speculation among Brown biographers that the use of mesmerism or hypnotism offered him a chance to try to control white audience members in a turnabout of the power dynamic from when he was enslaved. Henry Brown returned to the United States in 1875 with his new family, his wife Jane and their daughter Annie. And he billed himself as Professor Box Brown, and he continued to tour as an entertainer, primarily in the Northeast, and then moving to Canada in the early 1880s. His act at this point had evolved so that in addition to relaying his personal story, which always drew a crowd, he would also do some of his tricks and also give brief scientific lectures. He'd also give musical performances under the heading Professor Box Brown's Troubadour Jubilee Singers, in which his family would perform. Song had been part of his act for a long time when he talked about slavery and abolition, and he's said to have had an outstanding voice. Henry Box Brown performed his magic act in Ontario, Canada, on February 26th of 1889, and that is his last known stage appearance. For a long time, the date and place of his death were always recounted as unknown, and a lot of sources you look at will still say they are not known. But in recent years, Martha J. Cutter, a professor of English and Africana Studies at the University of Connecticut, started looking for documentation of the deaths and burials in the Toronto area and appears to have identified his death as June 15, 1897, including locating his grave at the Necropolis Cemetery in Toronto. Brown's wife, Jane, lived with their daughter, whose married name was Annie Jefferson, until she died in 1924. It's really not clear what happened to Henry's first wife, Nancy, and their four children together. We don't know if he sought them out once he was free or after slavery was abolished. And the fallout between Brown and James Smith that happened back in 1851 was in part due to Smith's criticism that Henry Box Brown hadn't tried to buy his family's freedom. (laughs) 
Yeah, we don't really know that whole story, though. For all we know, he did look into it, or maybe he couldn't because it was too painful. We have no idea. It's really interesting. One of the things that that uh, scholar we just mentioned, Martha J. Cutter, brought up in an article I was reading was how, in a strange way, even though Henry Box Brown escaped slavery, he was sort of a slave to his own life story because he ended up telling it for decades and decades over uh, even after it had been long past abolition and not a tool to try to help educate people, but just became like part of this narrative that he had to live over and over, which was an interesting perspective to have. There's also a really beautiful version of this story from the podcast, The Memory Palace. It's called Picture a Box. It's really fascinating. And he used the actual box that he was shipped from Richmond to Philadelphia in as part of his stage show for a long time. So there's this whole gravity to all of that. Like, I can't, I mean, again, it's from my perspective, which can't really understand his mindset at all, but, like, I can't imagine having to, like, go through that over and over and relive what had to have been a terrifying, though ultimately successful experience. It's interesting to think about. I have listener mail. Yay, what is it? It's about Andrew Carnegie. Uh, It's from our listener, Kathy. We have mentioned her on the show before. We read her listener email about Ann Lister. But she wrote this morning and said, I just finished the Andrew Carnegie episode. Towards the end, when you talked about Carnegie wanting to buy off the Kaiser to end World War I, you said he was stopped by President Teddy Roosevelt. I'm sure you know that Teddy Roosevelt wasn't president during World War I and that Woodrow Wilson was. Maybe you were just trying to keep your listeners on our toes. So this is a clarification thing because uh, that is my clunky and poor synthesis of information. Uh, It was Roosevelt, but here is what was actually playing out. It wasn't to end the war, but to prevent it to begin with. So uh, towards the end of the the Bosnian crisis, which was 1909, there were a lot of other things happening in Europe that were making it pretty apparent that war was a very likely possibility. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt had promised Andrew Carnegie at that point that he would be his envoy of peace to leaders of Europe that Carnegie, even though he was very influential at this point, just couldn't quite get connections to. And this was actually in exchange for Carnegie funding one of Roosevelt's big game expeditions in Africa, which was very expensive. And so Roosevelt had promised that he was going to talk to the Kaiser and explain that he would relay all of their conversations to Carnegie, essentially acting as sort of a go-between. And in 1910, Roosevelt did start his European tour Uh, And his meeting of Kaiser Wilhelm II was going to be part of that. And he was going to try to broker this peace. But King Edward died in the midst of this process, which halted all diplomatic discussions. Uh, Roosevelt and Wilhelm did meet, but only unofficially, and they did not speak of the peace plans that Andrew Carnegie had devised. Uh, which was part of all of that. So that was my poor way to um, to put it in there. So that's my apology for being clunky. But I wanted to read this quote that Carnegie wrote uh, about how this whole thing played out, and it kind of evidences how unhappy he was and why he felt that his whole efforts at peace at the time were kind of a failure. He said, quote, "'There has been a fatal flaw in my strategy to stop the war, the misplaced trust in those I counted on as my colleagues in my quest for peace.'" Uh, so he felt like he failed in trusting Roosevelt because he did not make good on his his promise to broker a peace. Uh, if you would like to write to us, you can do so at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. You can also find us at MissedInHistory.com. We are everywhere on social media as Missed in History, so you can contact us there as well. If you want to visit that website, MissedInHistory.com, we have back catalog of every episode that has ever existed of the podcast, including show notes for the ones that Tracy and I have worked on. So come and hang out with us online at MissedInHistory.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 